I'd like to take time to go over the, the memory verses. Is there anyone who'd like to share one with us this evening? No one at all. Hallelujah. Let's turn to the, um, the passage there in Timothy. Anybody remember the reference? Good, that's right. First Timothy 2, 1. 1, 2, 1, right? Let's go there and we'll read that one together. We have a work day on Saturday. Prayer at 7.30. Work day starts at 8. Always a good time of fellowship and a good opportunity to get some good things done on the facilities. Amen? Amen. Amen. So we look forward to that. Uh, <clears throat> let's read this aloud together. First Timothy 2, 1. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. 1 Timothy 2, 1. Let's do that again, shall we? 1 Timothy 2, 1. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. 1 Timothy 2, 1. That's not so hard, is it? No, no. I, <clears throat> I would anticipate uh, continuing to encourage and exhort people to memorize scripture. I don't know that I will change my ways along those lines anytime in the near future. So let's hide God's word in our heart. Amen. We took some time on Sunday and we talked of, of praying. Anybody... Um, uh, still got your card? Good. Uh, been praying? Yes. Good, that's good. Yep. Uh, continue to pray for those souls. It is the Lord who gives us that opportunity, that privilege of being used by him to see souls uh, strengthened in their walk with the Lord, see souls convicted by the Holy Spirit of their need to get right with Jesus whether they be uh, weak or wayward as born-again uh, people or whether they as non-born-again people, unsaved people, they need to humbly cry out to Jesus and commit their lives to him. God gives us the opportunity, the responsibility to pray, doesn't he? This evening we, um, we change topics. Um, we're not going to talk on that topic this evening. Uh, we'll talk about something that has been on my heart and mind to discuss uh, <clears throat> with this body. Uh, been there, just rolling around for some time now. But uh, there were just a, a few things that were mentioned at our meeting yesterday that sort of confirmed, nope, we need to spend a little time on this subject. The title is Happily Married, Happily Unmarried. Now, be careful there. It's not happily married, unhappily married. Good there. Make sure we get the un in the right place. Happily married, happily unmarried. You know, in our, in our fellowship, uh, we, uh, we recognize that uh, the normal course is for people to uh, marry, as young people would grow up, they'd, uh, in the Lord, find somebody of like precious faith, be joined before the Lord in that union, establish a household, raise up some kids. That's going to be the norm, isn't it? We'll talk a little bit about that. Just briefly review some passages that speak to things that relate to marriage or husbands, wives. But we also want to speak to unmarried because there are plenty of people here this evening, plenty of folks, a significant percentage of our, our fellowship, unmarried. And we should be always very uh, content in Jesus, satisfied in him, fulfilled in him, mindful of our relationship with him above all else. You see, <clears throat> in part, uh, we're on the subject because we, from time to time, recognize, okay, we got some folks that are unhappily married, and that's not the will of the Lord, is it? Any married person knows that, uh, sure, uh, marriage is uh, not a bed of roses 
or uh, there are thorns with the roses, or however. It's not perfect. Anybody would be naive to think that marriage was the, the cure-all for my, for my woes and loneliness and, and uh, despair and, and, uh, and emptiness. That would be um, simple. It would not be wise, it would not be biblical to think along those lines. And yet we got people who are unmarried. Yeah, we got people who are married, wish they weren't. Uh, we got people who are <clears throat> unmarried, wish they were. And sometimes the unmarried people, uh, they're, they're too distracted in their interests and their concerns to be married. That's not right. That's not a healthy condition. We're to be a people in love with Jesus, aren't we? Amen. The fact that we're on this subject this evening has nothing to do with me celebrating an anniversary tomorrow. <laughs> Just for the record. <laughs> 38 years. And I'm a, happy, I'm a happily married man. Amen. I tell my wife often, man, I just, I tell her often, very regular basis. I'm sure glad she said yes. Her response is, she says what, Marianne? Sure glad you asked. Yep. She's, she's, <laughs> it's a good response, huh? We do that exchange on a pretty regular basis. I, I'm I'm glad to be married. But I'll tell you right up front, before I married, I was by no means convinced that that was God's will for my life. No. Because I read passages of scripture like we'll read this evening about being content in Jesus and our lives being hid with Christ and God. And we're not our own. We're just servants of the Lord. And I didn't consider that it was uh, some right of mine to expect or presume that I was necessarily going to get married. No. I wasn't even sure that I wanted to be. But my wife convinced me that I did. No. <laughs> but Christians, whether married and happily married, should not be finding their contentment and their, their meaning and purpose in that relationship. Now I'm secure. And now I'm fulfilled because I've got a husband, because I've got a wife. I've got, we've got our home. We've got our kids. And now life has meaning and purpose. Life is in the sun. Amen? Life is in Jesus. And for the married person that doesn't have the best of relationships. We've got some of those in, in, our, in our fellowship. People believe in for the salvation of their spouses. Yeah. yeah. Keep praying, keep believing, like we were talking over the weekend. Amen? Amen? But whether that spouse gets saved or whether they never get saved, each day we can be fully content in Jesus. And we, don't have to, we should not allow ourselves to think in terms of how miserable life is with this unsaved spouse and how wonderful life would be with a saved spouse. Again, life is in the sun. Life is wonderful when you're content in Jesus. Amen. Your eyes are on him. Our eyes are, we're in love with our Lord. He is our sufficiency, our all in all. You know, maybe as we wade into things, uh, I'll just throw this on out there because it didn't make it into my notes, but I think it needs to be said that if we are in our present state not content in Jesus, might we reasonably consider that we're in a trial that... Uh, that gives us opportunity to learn to be so, that is to learn to be content in Jesus. And maybe there won't be a, a significant change in circumstances till we learn some lessons. You with me there? That reasonable? 
happily married. Let's talk about happily married. Go with me over to Genesis chapter 2. We'll visit some familiar passages, as I say. Genesis chapter 2. The Lord sure does know our hearts, doesn't he? Does he know what's good for us? As a loving Heavenly Father, is there any good thing that he will withhold? What's the best thing that he can do for you? More of himself. That's it. That's the right answer. You got an A on the test. More of himself is the best thing that he can give. So is that what we're wanting? Is that what we're desiring? Or is there a yes, but? Yes, but. Is there more than one thing on the list of things that we desire? Oh, we like to, you know, in the, the most absolute terms, say, just more of Jesus. Just more of Jesus. That's all I, all I want, all I need. Well, we need to examine our our uh, hearts' wanderings and our thoughts and our imaginations, they line up? Is the heart characterized by longing for just more of him, to know him more, to be found in him? Or is it longing for uh, things to change in relationships? Oh, I love Jesus, but it sure would be nice if I could have it this way or that. How does that sound to, to Jesus? The one who considers us all his bride. You know, when you, when you know somebody well, you know when they're, they're, they're content, happy, got joy, don't you? And you can tell when there's just something not quite right and they're just, you know, unsettled and, and not satisfied. And you can tell that. Plainly. Think Father knows our hearts? Think he knows when we're satisfied in him? These are the things we want to talk about this evening. Because the only way you can be happily married is to be happy in Jesus, content in him. And the only way you can be happily unmarried is to, to be in love with the Lord of glory, the one to whom you are espoused. Amen? Amen. Genesis chapter 2, verse 18 says, The Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make and help meet for him. So this from the very earliest is going to be the norm, isn't it? We encourage people to get married there are times when we'll take some time and, and we'll talk about, you know, uh, why you're not married when you, you could be no good reason why not to be. Eligible candidates around and sometimes we'll talk about those things. You know, we'll, we'll get with people and think, you know, hey, what's, what's the problem? Bible says it's not good that, God says, not good that man should be alone. Why are you? We'll talk along those lines sometimes, won't we? Yeah? As we encourage people to consider God's plan, his norm, his uh, general pattern. Male and female, he made them, right? He goes on in this passage, pick it up at, at verse 20. Adam gave names to all cattle, to all the fowl of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found and help meet for him. Interesting the way it's put, isn't it? All the critters come parading by, but mm, I think I'll pass. Mm, you know, I like horses, but uh, not that well. Mm, okay, the gorilla, little hairy, mm, pass. And on and on they parade by, right? There was not found in help meet for him. The Lord God caused the deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept and took one of his ribs, and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, 
made he woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. So this is how it started out. And this is the general pattern. A husband and a wife come together, they become one. We, of course, talk to Christians. Uh, you know, we live in a world where uh, not only are relationships uh, not sealed in solemn covenant before God, and I talk of secular society, there's a disregard for, for obvious basic uh, uh, biology in our culture, isn't there? And so we're not talking about those people without. We're talking about God's plan for his people. Man leaves father, mother, cleave to his, he cleaves to his wife, and they become one, one flesh. In Proverbs chapter 18, verse 22, the Bible says, Whoso findeth a wife, findeth a good thing, and obtaineth favor of the Lord. That's a blessing that God brings two together. That's a blessing from the Lord. Whoso finds a wife, finds a good thing, obtains favor of the Lord. When people approach, when Christians approach marriage with that understanding, maybe they're not married yet, but they have a desire to be so, they would consider a wife a blessing from God, a blessing from the Lord for their, for their well-being, spirit, soul, and body. We're not... Uh, we have no intention this evening of talking much at all about things uh, purely natural. Uh, you know, the, how, you know, guys just want some, some babe on their arm or somebody to, you know, to snuggle with at night. Uh, nope, nope. We're talking about a union, a covenant that's established between a man and a woman is unto the Lord for the glory of God. God said that he'd make a help meet for man or suited to. And if that's God's perspective, then we should consider that that's something that man needs. Amen? That fair? If God says that I will make some a help that's suited to him and help meet, it's not help meet, excuse me, it's not help mate, Sometimes people who don't know their Bibles quote it that way. It's not a helpmate, a playmate. It's a help suited to him. Amen? Yeah. And if God makes it that way, then that's according to the needs that he sees in Adam. And a wife, uh, he who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor of the Lord. This is the way God blesses people in this union, doesn't he? Uh, similarly, in, in Proverbs 19, 14, houses and riches are an inheritance from fathers, but a prudent wife is from the Lord. Now, you'll notice that these scriptures are talking about the, the blessing that a wife is. Well, frankly, there are more of those kinds of, of verses in, in the scripture than there are from the other perspective. There aren't verses in Proverbs that talk about a good husband being a blessing to his wife. Though there are enough uh, instructions in the scripture that, uh, that speak of husband's responsibilities and plenty of good Bible examples, but there's not a verse that says, you know, whoso finds a husband finds a good thing and obtains favor of the Lord. Most are from the perspective of a man being blessed when God adds a wife to him. Houses and riches are an inheritance from fathers. Those are the kinds of things, kind of things that a, a dad could give, right? But a good godly wife, a Christian man considers that's coming from God. That's not, you know, that's not dad going to get me a, the, the right woman. No, I'm going to trust God for the right one for me. A prudent wife is from the Lord. Proverbs 12, 4, a virtuous woman is a crown to her husband. But she that maketh ashamed is as rottenness in the bones. Ladies, I didn't bring along any of the Proverbs that deal about the continual dripping and the nagging wife or anything like that, okay? Going to leave those alone this evening. 
but they're in there too. But we won't talk about that this evening much. A virtuous woman is a crown to her husband. These are passages of scripture that speak of the, the from father's perspective, he, he blesses people by bringing them together by bringing them into union, into covenant relationship with one another in his sight. That's the way in which he blesses people. Proverbs chapter 31. If we're going to talk about virtuous women, we've got to go to Proverbs 31, don't we? Spend a little time, a few minutes over there. I brought it along from the Amplified. Uh, from 10 and following, verse 10. A capable intelligent, and virtuous woman. Well, is that the standard? He says, who can find? <laughs> who can find her? Some of you guys should be. Uh, she, was, she was capable and intelligent and virtuous enough to consider that, yep, she could draw on the grace of God to be married to you. Yep. A capable, intelligent, and virtuous woman, who is he who can find her? She is far more precious than jewels, and her value is far above rubies or pearls. The heart of her husband trusts in her confidently and relies on and believes in her securely, so that he has no lack of honest gain or need of dishonest spoil. She comforts, encourages, and does him only good as long as there is life within her. That's a good godly woman, isn't it? Amen. And those of you men <clears throat> that have a good godly wife, you know that, that this doesn't help tell half the story. Verse 30, favor is deceitful, beauty is vain, but a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. A good godly woman recognizes that if she is married, then the most important, the, the, most, <clears throat> the most admirable quality that she could look to develop would be her fear of God, a holy life. Because favor is deceitful and beauty is vain. They're fleeting. They come and go. But a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. A good godly woman, perhaps married, places the greatest emphasis not on her outward appearance, but on the adornment of a meek and a quiet spirit. She cultivates her relationship with Jesus and considers that <clears throat> that's most beautiful to God and to any man of God who's serious about his relationship with the Lord. Amen? Amen. A woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Uh, an unmarried woman, perhaps one who desires to be un unmarried and maybe desiring to be married, at least seriously considering that that may be something that Father has for you. Well, what's most important? Fearing God. Loving Jesus, first and foremost. You don't want to try to win somebody with beauty and charm because if that's what won them, what's going to hold them when beauty and charm are gone? But the godly character that you develop that is most important to you, ladies, if there's a godly man that is interested in you because of the godly qualities that they, that he, he or, yes, they see in you, yes, then 
That's something that should be just growing bigger and richer and fuller in your life all your days. Favor is deceitful and beauty is vain. But a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. In Ecclesiastes, he says just a few things about happy marriages. Amen? Happily married. Put Jesus first. Fear the Lord. Consider that these are truths that would apply to the married or those that might contemplate marriage. Here, Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow, but woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him up. Again, if two lie together, then they have heat, but how can one be warm alone? And if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him. And a threefold fold cord is not quickly broken. So, again, two are better than one. If you've got a good marriage, you can sure say amen to this passage of Scripture, can't you? Two are better than one. You know the, the help and the support and the strength that you draw in, in that relationship. If you're married and you've got an unsaved spouse, well... Yeah, you don't have the benefit of being able to have a true spiritual companion in that relationship. That's something you're trusting Father for. But you're not alone because the Lord Jesus is there for you, isn't he? Isn't he? Yep, and so you're, you're content in him. And then, of course, in, 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 in marriage, you know, there's children. I brought along Psalm 127. Lo, children are in heritage of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. So in a good, solid Christian marriage, this is a, a blessing that commonly accompanies. Again, just like we would say that, okay, the person is un, that who is unmarried, desiring to be married, they should not think that, oh, uh, life is, is empty without a spouse. No. And would be full and wonderful if I had a spouse. No. No. Content in Jesus. Right? And you get married, and now what? Well, now we got to have kids. Well, again, uh, if you're counting on the children making life rich and full, and without them, life is empty. I know I've got my spouse, but, no. The Lord teaches us to be content in Jesus. Amen? Amen? Amen. But, again, children are a blessing, and uh, we're at liberty to enjoy them if we got them. They're not, oh, you know, just a... a uh, a pain in the derriere, you know, just a, 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 a weight of burden. No, they're a blessing, blessing from God. Christians are at liberty to enjoy the children. But, uh, oh, you know, uh, we only had, we didn't have any, only had one. Oh, we should have had some more, you know. No, there are all kinds of reasons for being discontent. Uh, we don't have to look far for them if we're, if we're looking at all. But there are a lot of reasons to be content in Jesus, aren't there? Yeah. But yes, in a, in a normal relationship, husbands and wives, they come together, they're best of friends, and they're committed to Jesus uh, first and foremost, then they're committed to one another, and they're mindful of loving each other and laying down their lives for one another and, and building one another up. Amen? Raising up a godly seed, and all those things are part of many of our lives in relationships. Amen? Amen. Let's talk about <clears throat> happily unmarried a little bit more. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. I'm sure I've referenced it a few times over the years, but not very often. This is not a passage of Scripture that I've had occasion to reference. Many times over the years. <clears throat> we 
We'll pick it up at verse 25 of 1 Corinthians 7, and I'm reading from the New King James Version. Now concerning virgins, I have no commandment from the Lord, yet I give judgment as one whom the Lord in his mercy has made trustworthy. I suppose, therefore, that it is good because of the present distress that it is good for a man to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be loosed. Are you loosed from a wife? Do not seek a wife. Well, as I said a minute ago there, a few minutes ago, we are generally encouraging people that, yeah, um, marriage is a blessing from God. Not good that man should be alone. But this is also in the scripture, isn't it? I suppose that this is good because of the present distress, that it is good for a man to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be loosed. Are you loosed from a wife? Do not seek a wife. But even if you do marry, you have not sinned. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. Nevertheless, such will have trouble in the flesh, but I would spare you. So he, he says right up, right, real plain, in very plain language, if you do this, he, he says, I suppose it is good uh, if you're not married, don't seek to be married. But he, then he says, if you do marry, no sin in getting married. So we don't consider, okay, well, new covenant, we're born again. We, you know, we know that, that, uh, that, that we have this spiritual relationship with Jesus, uh, the bridegroom, we're the bride, and we, you know, we uh, don't want to be unfaithful to the Lord, so we'll just remain celibate. No, no, that's not what the, the scripture teaches. It may be something that, uh, that some should consider that that is God's will for their lives. That might be God's will for your life. You should not, nobody here this evening should think, oh, you know, and I speak to unmarried, okay? Nobody, nobody that's unmarried should think that, that is, it is absolutely God's will for your life for you to get married. You should consider that it might good to stay, be good to stay unmarried. But then he says, verse 28, but if you do marry... Even if you do marry, you've not sinned. So there's no absolute commandment that you should not get married. Just remain faithful in your service and love to Jesus, right? And anything less than that, anything other than that, you want to get married and you're unfaithful to the Lord? Nope, doesn't say that. No sin in getting married. If a virgin marries, she has not sinned. Nevertheless, such will have trouble in the flesh, but I would spare you. But he doesn't totally spare because he goes on and talks a little bit about what life might be like. Verse 29, as he continues, This I say, brethren, the time is short, so that from now on even those who have wives should be as though they had none. Guys, that was an opportunity for you to say amen if you wanted to. Those who weep as though they did not weep. Those who rejoice as though they did not rejoice. Those who buy as though they did not possess. And those who use this world as not misusing it. For the form of this world is passing away. Well, just uh, for a few minutes on this passage. I think we, uh, we understand what he's speaking of here. If uh, to some... Uh, Marriage is the, 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 the ultimate goal. I get my spouse, I get a wife, I get a husband, and we start our family, and we have our home, and we have our, you know, we, we raise our kids, and we have, these, we, we have these places that we go, and we do these things together, and that's what makes life rich and full. Then we are way off course, way off track. We're servants of God. We're called to, to, to honor God with our all. We're not our own. 
We don't get born again and uh, forgiven of our sins and find newness of life in Jesus and then uh, have Father just turn us loose to live our little happy earth lives doing as we see fit and we please until Jesus comes back, the trumpet sounds, and we go the way of the grave, and they say nice things about it at our funeral, and, and, you know, and our grandkids remember us fondly, and no. That's not the way we live. You got a wife? You got a husband? You got a family? You got those things? Yeah, here he says, you're to live life as though you had none. And that doesn't mean that you neglect the responsibilities. You just don't make that marriage and that family and that home more than it should be. That spouse that you have, you know, he's, he that's married as though he had none. You're not, you're not a husband for what you can get out of it. You're a husband to that woman, that wife, to help her grow in grace and in the knowledge of God's will for her life. To see her conformed with, to the image of Jesus. Washed with the water of, of the word of God. Making sure that she's prepared for her bridegroom, Jesus. When he says, as though you had none, it's, it's not living for self. Selfish interests. It's, it's living for God's purposes. For the form of this world is passing away. It's not all about the here and now. And he says in verse 32, I want you to be without care. He who is unmarried cares for the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But he who is married cares about the things of the world, how he may please his wife. So what, do, what kind of emphasis are we going to place on getting married? When the Bible under God here, Holy Spirit says, I want you to be without care. He who is unmarried cares for the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord. He who is married cares for the things of the world, how he may please his wife. Which one to you sounds more spiritual? Well, in the context of uh, this passage here, that's pretty plain, isn't it? So let's not overemphasize the importance and the significance of marriage. We already talked about the blessing of marriage. God, not good that man should, don't forget the passages we looked at a few minutes ago, okay? But these are also true, aren't they? They are also true. Any married couple, I mean, you can have, uh, you can have two people that love Jesus very, very much and genuinely put the Lord first in their lives as individuals, Above the relationship they have with their spouse. <coughs> but still, there's time and attention that needs to be given to that spouse, isn't there? And there are times when, yeah, you might think, well, you know, I could be doing something that would, would, would have, uh, on one hand, it would seem to me that it would have greater and, 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 and uh, uh, greater value spiritually. But there are some. Whatever, the, the, the dishwasher's leaking. I got to go take care of that. And so, just like, a, like the apostle says, he wants us without care. And this is without having to give excessive attention to taking care of a, a spouse. Amen? And the things that pertain to married life and family. And those are all good. Marriage is good. God seeks a godly seed. Children are a blessing from the Lord, aren't they? Yep, they are. But they take time. And the unmarried cares for the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord. The married one cares for the things of the world, how he may please his wife. So we would consider here that there are times when we're going to have to draw the line, aren't we? Okay, my wife, you know, as a husband and the head of a house, wife says, oh, I'd like to do this, or couldn't we get that, or how about this? And husband says, no, not right now. 
and maybe wifey wants to whine a little bit. And then the husband said, man, I got to keep, keep my wife happy. I want to take into consideration her needs, her concerns, her interests, her desires. I don't want to be just doing what I want to do. I got to take into consideration, make sure that I'm, I'm being fair in this relationship and, and accommodating her interests and her preferences sometimes. And, but sometimes it's just saying, no, I don't think that that's the best thing for, for us as a household and as a couple right now or as a family right now. And husbands have to bring leadership and make those kinds of decisions that don't always make people happy. He who cares about the, he who is married cares about the things of this world, how he may please his wife. There is a difference between a wife and a virgin. An unmarried woman cares about the things of the Lord, that she may be holy both in body and in spirit. But she who is married cares about the things of the world, how she may please her husband. So Paul carefully addresses it from both, perspe both perspectives here in this passage, doesn't he? Speaking not only to men and the care that they need to provide for their wives, but also to the women who aren't married or are married. He says, yep, yeah, the unmarried can attend to the things of the Lord. But the married woman has to attend to the things that please her husband. And that's I say for your own profit, verse 35. Not that I may put a leash on you, or ball and chain, as the case may be. I chuckled when I saw that in the New King James. Not that I put a leash on you, but for what is proper, and that you may serve the Lord without distraction. Well, he is not saying that, that if you get married, then you can't serve the Lord without distraction. No. But he does say you're going to have to attend to things that pertain to that relationship. You're going to have to give some time and attention to that relationship, aren't you? Yep, you are. And he says that it might be better not to. Remember that according to Matthew 22... There is neither marrying nor giving in marriage in heaven, is there? No. So any, any union between a husband and a wife is, is only temporal. It's only, it's only going to last for, for this time in this life. So it's not like some permanent eternal union is, is being established, is it? No. Happily unmarried. Look at me over to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. If you're not content in Jesus, I bet you Jesus wants you to teach you to be so. Colossians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him, who is the head of all principality and power. Oh, I'm just, just half a man without a wife. Oh, I'm just not fulfilled without a husband. You're complete in Jesus as a Christian. In Jesus, you're complete. He's all we need. We don't need a spouse to, to be fulfilled. We need Jesus to be fulfilled. In John 1, 16, of his fullness have all we received. And grace for grace. Are you fully satisfied in your relationship with the Lord? Go with me over to Ephesians chapter 3. That passage that we spent some time on there. I want to look at it from a, a few other things in a little bit different perspective. G 
Jesus is our all. Is he? The Bible says he is. To the Christian, he is. He wants to make that real to us. From verse 16, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Well, that's full life right there, isn't it? Being filled with all the fullness of God. Do you need a spouse to be full, for life to be full, for life to take on real meaning and purpose? Is there just some emptiness, some void in your life without that spouse? That spouse will never fill that void. Jesus fills voids. that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. And then verses 20 and 21, of course, now unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Be encouraged. God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we ask or think. Amen. According to the power that worketh in us able to do exceeding abundantly above all we ask or think. Do you think you know what's good for you? Hmm? Do you really think you know what's good for you? Well, you might have a, 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 some inkling, but uh, we're going to trust God, aren't we? He is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we could ask or think. Maybe the Lord does have a spouse for you. Maybe he's got one a whole lot better than the one you're willing to settle for. Amen? And like we said a bit ago, maybe the Lord is uh, doing a work in you that would prepare you to be a good godly spouse to the good godly person that he's preparing for you now. How about that? If you're not content in Jesus, then would somebody who's in love with the Lord want to marry you? How about that one? If you'd settle for a relationship willing to compromise on your, willing to compromise in your relationship with the Lord, then a godly, that's not attractive to a godly person. Is it? No. Somebody who's serious about Jesus wants somebody who's serious about Jesus. Not just serious about marriage. Go get me a man. Don't care, don't care what, what, let's say he's a man, just want a man. Man of God. Man of God. Unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. That's, some, that's a place of real trust, isn't it? The Lord wants to teach us to trust him, doesn't he? He really wants to teach us to trust him, be content in him, be satisfied in him, fulfilled in him, trust him. Trust him with our lives, with our all. Hallelujah. Consider... Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Being happily unmarried, remember that you are not your own. Verses 19 and 20 of 1 Corinthians 6. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So a person who desires to be married thinks about marriage maybe thinks too much about marriage, should remember that you're not your own. You've been bought with a price. And you should think, we should all think in terms of glorifying God. 
with our all. Romans 12, we present our bodies as a living sacrifice to God. Amen? Holy, acceptable unto him. That's our reasonable service. We give our lives to God. He gave his life for us. We've been purchased with the blood of Jesus Christ. We give our all back to him. That's reasonable, isn't it? And marriage is not uh, an absolute necessity. And it's not a guarantee. Is it a blessing? Yes. Pastor, are you teaching against getting married? Are you encouraging the single people in this fellowship to just forget about the, the, the prospects of marrying? You know that that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about being happily unmarried while you're unmarried, however long that might be, content in Jesus, satisfied in him, busy about his business. <clears throat> We're running out of time, but that's not, that's not a bad thing because I'm running out of notes here too. Second Timothy chapter 2. This is a big, uh, big part of it. Uh, the kind of thing that Paul addresses over there in, in that passage in Corinthians. You know, attending on the Lord without distraction. Second Timothy 2, 3 says what? For, excuse me, 4. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that it may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Get real busy about the business of the kingdom. If you're single now, maybe think you'd like to get married, not sure. Maybe you're thoroughly, you are 100% certain you have heard from God three dreams, visions. You, you know you're getting married. This thing, all this stuff is not for you, man. You know. You've prayed and believed God. You've heard people prophesy over you. You've heard, you know, you're getting married. Now, what about getting busy about Jesus' business? While you are single, until such time as you do get married, Use the time for the advancement of the kingdom, the edification of the body, making converts and discipling them. Amen? Amen. Just, just sowing into the lives of souls with your all. Think about right now, using the time, if you were married, and okay, like we read, you know, caring for the things of your spouse, Okay, how about using that time now to build up the body? That time that you would be sowing into the care of a husband and a family if you had one, but you don't right now. Pouring your life into just personal pleasure while you, you know, until you get married. Well, I'll, you know, I'll get, I'll take, I'll devote all kinds of time to taking care of a husband or, or you know, a wife if I had one, but I don't, so I'm just going to goof off until I do. Use your singleness for the building up of the body, for the edification of the body of Christ. I, <clears throat> I can't help but think that one that is the heart that the Lord desires to work into us. Amen? A real love for the Lord. Above a love for self. A delight in him and, in, and, and, and a, accounting it a privilege to serve him with our all. To attend upon the Lord without distraction. Can't help but think that that's what the Lord desires to work into us. And yes, we should certainly consider that practically that could look very attractive to somebody who was serious about Jesus themselves and also interested in marrying. Amen? A virtuous woman. Or a good godly man. Busy about the work of the kingdom. No man that wars entangles himself with the affairs of this life. Luke chapter 8 speaks of how some seed falls are on the ground where there are thorns growing and the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and lust of other things enter in and choke out the word of God. Well, Paul said, 
I'd have you without carefulness. You're in a position right now where you're, <clears throat> you're uh, relieved of some care that needs to be given to a spouse if you're not married. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. Be thankful to the Father for that. Because sometimes cares can come on in and choke out the life of the Word of God in us. So don't think that being unmarried is something terrible. Life in Jesus is wonderful. Amen? And if marriage is part of God's plan for your life, then be content in him and trust him to provide a spouse as he sees fit in his time, good godly one. I wouldn't discourage anybody here, you know, who's not married, desires to get married, from praying about that. No, if you believe that it is, it's, it's part of God's plan for your life, to get married someday? Nothing wrong with praying along those lines, Lord. But, but don't just pray, Lord, I want to be married. How about praying, Lord, do your work in me, conform me to the image of Jesus and prepare me to get married if it is your will for my life. Teach me to be content right where I am right now. Teach me, Lord, to be busy about your business right now. Serving you faithfully with, with my all, just pouring my life into your work. Until such time as you might see fit to bring along a spouse for me. I, it's hard to imagine better preparation for marriage if that happens to be what <clears throat> God has for us. Amen? In 1 Corinthians, excuse me, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Verse 10 says, therefore we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. For we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in his body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. I'd like to just modify that slightly and say, therefore we make it our aim, whether married or unmarried, to be well-pleasing to him. Amen? Amen? whether married or unmarried, to be well-pleasing then before, because we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account. So if we're unmarried, let's seek to just be well-pleasing to the Lord in our singleness. Amen? Content in Jesus? Busy about the work of the kingdom? How to find the body? We make it our aim to be well-pleasing to him because we're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And if you're married, yeah, be a good, godly husband. And if you're the wife, be that good, godly wife. Well-pleasing to the Lord. Raise up a good, godly seed. Do the things that are pleasing to God in that relationship. It's ordained of God. A blessing from the Lord. Honor God in it. Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for... <clears throat> we thank you for marriage, and we thank you for singleness. We thank you for truth in the ministry of your spirit that teaches us to seek your face and your will for our lives and to guard against giving place to the thoughts that the relationship is, the, is, is some center of our lives, the relationship with a spouse or having a family. Those are at best secondary relationships, secondary to the relationship that we have with you. Oh Lord, when we're where we should be in our walk with you and our love for you, then we can be good husbands, good wives, good dads and moms. And if we are single, then we're not incomplete.
Our lives are hid with Christ in God. And life is rich and full. Because we're walking in the Spirit. We're about the work of the kingdom. We have precious brothers and sisters in the Lord. The body of Christ. What a gift, Father God. Father, I pray that you'd help each one to keep their heart with all diligence. To work to maintain a proper and biblical perspective of what these relationships are to be. And stay far from anything that is inconsistent with your plan and purpose for marriage. We trust you, Father God, for that grace. We give you thanks for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, be sure and greet one another in the love of the Lord Jesus. God's grace and peace go with you all.